Um, most of y'all been in Sunday school, so yeah. you know it. But uh, I just want to read it in case you missed it. Hey, man, one of those times you better nod it off in class. <laughs> just want to read it. I want to start at verse 1. Uh, we're going to focus in in a lot of verses, but I want to start at verse 1. Jesus says, New Living Translation, don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. This were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you. So you will always be with me where I am. You know where I'm going and how to get there. No, we don't know, Lord Thomas said. We haven't any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am, even after all the time I've been with you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. The truth is, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. <laughs> and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Amen. You may see it. It is easy for any of us after any point in our journey with Christ, especially in our journey of ministry, to become complacent, to get lukewarm, to become casual in our relationship with God, our relationship with Christ, and our relationship with the people of God and followers of Christ. We don't talk about it a whole lot, uh, but the reality we see week after week. In most churches, I don't care how large they are, they're still typically 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. Typically, the 80% that don't do the work, they show up on Sunday, and then you don't see them no more. And when they show up, they ain't going to do much when they get there. They ain't going to give much when they get there, but they're going to be there. Uh, that's just the reality, unfortunately. I believe that reality is the reality because so many of us in our journey with Christ have just become complacent. We become casual. It's as though we've forgotten what God has done for us. And we've forgotten who God has called us to be. It's as though we've forgotten the privilege and the opportunity that we have in just being a child of God. If you're never the president or vice president of anything in the church, just being a child of God should be more than enough to excite you to serve him for the rest of your days. But oftentimes that doesn't seem to be enough. So we settle in. We go to church. We work. We serve. We sing, we pray, but the fire seems to be gone. That's true for members as well as pastors. It's easy for any of us, no matter what position we may find ourselves in, to become casual, to become comfortable, and just kind of go through the motions. You know, you just know you got to do it, so you do it. And because you think you know how to do it, then you do what you know how to do. And because people have become accustomed to how you do what you do, they let you do it the way you do it. And they don't realize or even understand or accept that God may not be working the way that God really wants to work. 
but because that's the norm for everybody else that it's been embraced and it's been celebrated. My challenge as I come today is to consider what God actually desires, not only for Pastor Pollard and Sister Pollard as he would use them as leaders of this ministry, but, but also what he desires of each of us. My encouragement to Pastor Pollard after several years of pastoral ministry is that he would not become complacent is that he would not become comfortable, that he wouldn't become content, that he would be satisfied in what God has done and satisfied in who God is, but not satisfied if he understands that what God has called him to is more than what he currently sees. And I believe that's the tension that we find in the text. The tension in the text in John chapter 14 is that Jesus is getting ready to go. He kind of sets the stage for his departure. He lets the disciples know I'm getting ready to go off the scene, but don't y'all worry about it. I got everything under control. I prepared a place for you, and you guys going to be all right. Everything's going to be cool. He said, you just got to continue to just trust in me. They get a little bit out of shape. And I like, wait, hold up just a minute. We weren't counting on this. Wasn't looking for this. Help us understand who you are and help us understand where you're going. Jesus has to let them know I am the way, the truth, the life. Right? All you got to do is believe in me. Everything going to be all right. They got questions about just, just show us. We still don't really believe that you are who you say you are. We've been journeying with you for a while, but, but we still got questions. We really do want to see the Father. We want to make sure that you are the bona fide Messiah, that you are the bona fide promised one. That's what we want to make sure of. So, so can you show us the Father so that since you say you're getting ready to go off the scene, we'll be all right knowing that you are who we believe you to be, that we didn't just waste these years walking with you, giving up everything. Can you just show us again and maybe another sign like the father or something. She says, well, if you see me, you see the father. He said, I understand y'all don't get it. That's okay. You still don't get it. Still don't understand. But but if you see me, you've seen him. And, and if you understand me, you understand him. Because I didn't do anything on my own. Everything I did, he helped me to do. Right? So I've been doing the work of the Father when you've watched me. So, so when you've seen my works and you've seen the hand of God upon me, the hand of the Father upon me. So all you got to do is pay attention to what I've done. He said, and if you don't believe what I say, at least believe based on what I've done. <laughs> And then it's there that he puts the tension in the text. It was already tense for them, but he adds a level of tension not only for them, but he adds another level of tension even for us because we weren't there. We can't understand how they might feel hearing that Jesus is saying he's getting ready to go. But, but he adds an element of tension. He says in the text beginning at verse 12, the truth is anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. The challenge for us this afternoon as we acknowledge the reality that many of us become complacent and many of us become casual, the challenge for us is can we believe what Jesus says over what other folk have to say? Other folks say you can come in and after a while you're going to lose your fire. Other folks say, oh, don't worry about it. You come on in. Yeah, I was like that once. I used to carry my Bible all the time. I used to read my Bible all the time. I used to pray all the time. Don't worry about it. That'll wear off. They'll blend on in like all the rest of us sooner or later, right? That's what other folks say. And yet when you look at the scripture, Jesus raises the bar for them and he raised the bar for us because Jesus says, anyone who believes in me will do the works that I've done and that was it. I mean, that's enough. But then he says, and they'll do greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. And I don't know about you, but that, that, that puts me on edge just a bit, right? For Jesus to say, you know, anybody who believes in me is going to do greater works than I've done. Not only will they do the work that I've done, but they'll do greater works than I've done. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about greater works. I want to talk about greater works for Pastor Paula. I want to talk about greater works for Sister Paula. I want to talk about greater works for all the preachers. I want to talk about greater works for the deacons. Everybody else who got a title want to talk about greater works. Everybody who don't have a title want to talk about greater works. Even for the children who believe in Jesus Christ want to talk about greater works, right? I want to talk about greater works. Jesus says you can do greater works. Now here's what blows me away because typically we, we do like categories, right? We, we have like a category of how you should live as a follower of Christ when you are a pastor and then we have a category of how you should live as a follower of Christ when you're everybody else. 
Now we understand that there, there are expectations that are there for pastors, there are qualifications that are there for pastors, but if you read the list very carefully, you will discover it's the same expectations and qualifications for everybody else who's a follower of Jesus Christ. Everybody who's a follower of Jesus Christ should be above reproach. <laughs> right? And everybody who's a follower of Jesus Christ should be hospitable. Right? Everybody who's a follower of Jesus Christ should be able to teach. That, 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 that's in there for anybody who, who believes so. So it's interesting to me that Jesus starts talking to the disciples about greater works. And Jesus actually says that doing greater works is possible for anybody who is a believer. Yeah. Doing greater works is possible for anybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ. If you are six and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus says you can do the same kind of stuff I've done. And he says, you can do greater things than I've done. That's what Jesus says. He said, if you're 66 and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do the things that I've done and you can do greater works than what I've done. And I can tell, by the way, some of y'all looking at me, y'all don't believe that. Some of y'all looking at me like, man, this might be a good sermon, but I don't believe what you have to say. Okay, look, let's just start here. Does Jesus say it? Yes. <laughs> right? So, Jesus does say it. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus cannot lie? I believe Jesus cannot. So if Jesus said it and Jesus can't lie, it got to be true. I, I can't allow what I see to determine what's truth. So maybe because I don't see it, you know, I said, well, I don't, I don't see people living like that. So I might decide it's not true. But if Jesus said it, it has to be true. So Jesus says, anybody who believes in me can do what I've done, and then they can do greater works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now that adds a level of tension for me. Yes. All right. That Jesus says anybody who believes can do greater works. Yes, the obvious question comes in, Jesus, what are you talking about when you say great works? All right. All right. <laughs> because the works are literally the works. So what are you talking about when you say greater works? Are you talking about more Jesus? Because sometimes, and, and some translators, when they when they read this, commentators, when they read this, say, well, he's obviously talking about we'll be able to do more stuff because he was only one person, and since he was only one person, and it's more of us who believe in him, then we'll be able to do more stuff. So greater has to do with quantity. It, it's about more because it has to do with quantity. We'll be able to do more things than Jesus was able to do because he only did ministry that we know of for about three and a half years. So, so we'll be able to do more as it relates to quantity. Some people think that it's more as it relates to quality because 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 Jesus says we can do greater works and Jesus said it has to do with quality of what we're able to do. We'll, we'll be able to do the kind of stuff that you did, but we'll, we'll be able to do it in a better way. I mean, we can spread the gospel now just by going on Twitter and, and sending out, you know, Romans 1 and 16. We can spread the gospel now by putting it on Facebook and, and now you can sit in your home in Peoria, Illinois and post something and somebody in Russia can read it, right? So, so maybe it's talking about the quality. We'll be able to use technology and things of that nature and spread the gospel in ways that Jesus could have never done. Maybe that's what Jesus is talking about, some people would say, but but as you look at it, understand, Jesus says you'll be able to do greater work. So, so if he's talking about greater works, what does the context suggest? What does the context of the passage teach us? He says you'll be able to do greater work because that might be significant. Because I'm going to be with the Father. So whatever the greater works are, they'll be able to be done because Jesus is getting ready to depart and be with the Father. So Jesus says that, that anybody who believes in me can do greater works, but we have to understand that the greater works is possible because Jesus is getting ready to depart. So the greater works is possible because Jesus is getting ready to take on an exalted position with the Father. Just walk with me. I know. I know. Just, just come on with me. Jesus says, because I'm getting ready to go to be with the Father, you're going to be able to do greater works. What are you talking about, Jesus? We're going to be able to do greater works because you're getting ready to go to be with the Father. Well, before Jesus goes to be with the Father, he's there with the disciples, and while he's there with the disciples, he's God in the flesh, and while he's God in the flesh, he's able to do some amazing stuff. I think Jesus does some amazing stuff. I mean, it's better than some of the stuff that we see even magicians do. Jesus is able to do stuff like cause blind people to see, able to do stuff like cause people who can't talk be able to talk. He's able to do stuff like stop a woman that has an issue of blood. He just stops and she don't bleed no more, right? He, he's able to cause people to get up from the dead. Lazarus, get up. The woman in name calls her son to get up. 
I mean, he's able to do some amazing stuff. He speaks to the wind. We're like, oh, hold up. Jesus talking. We need to chill out. We need to sit down. Lie down. Be still. Wave. Chill out. Chill out. Jesus talking. He's able to do some amazing stuff. He can take bread out of bread, fish out of fish. I mean, Jesus is able to do some amazing stuff. When he teaches, the folks say, man, he don't talk like the rest of them. He's talking with authority. He's able to do some amazing things. But Jesus says, you're going to be able to do greater works because I'm getting ready to go be with the Father. Now, Jesus, you did some amazing stuff while you're here. So you don't say, we're going to do the same kind of stuff and some greater stuff because you're getting ready to go be with the Father. What difference is it going to make that you're going to be with the Father? Well, if you understand, Jesus says, my exalted position, then you'll realize that the state I'm in right now really can't do for you what my exalted position is going to do for you. So Jesus says, it's going to be better for you after I'm gone than it is while I'm here. Some of y'all starting to catch up. Jesus says, because of my exalted position, see, yeah, everything changes after I die, get buried, and get up. I, I know we don't get excited about that much, but 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 everything changes. The, the whole framework changes after I lay down my life and I go in the grave and then I get up on the third day morning and I'm, I'm resurrected. I got all authority, all power in my hands. He said everything changes at that point. Your sin has been addressed at that point. Satan has been dealt with at that point. The, the promise that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you is it, going to be realized at the everything changes when I get to my exalted, but you do know that he's in his exalted position. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He, he don't have to stand up anymore because he's seated in his rightful place. Everything changes when he's in his exalted position. He says, because I'm going to be with the Father, you're going to be able to do what I do and greater. Okay, Jesus, so, so how is all this going to happen? Well, see, me dying, being in the grave, and getting up changes everything. And because it changes everything, it's going to change how you see what you saw. He said, he said, he said, just, just, just me going to the grave and, 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 and getting up and then you seeing me and knowing that I'm resurrected is going to change now how you see what you saw. I know y'all don't believe me. Go back to John chapter 2. It's, it's a little stuff tucked away in the scriptures that sometimes we just run by John chapter 2 and verse 22. In, in John chapter 2 and verse 22, he helps us to understand that because he's going to be with the Father, now his exalted position helps uh, the disciples to get clarity on some stuff. It was some stuff that they saw while he was there, but they didn't understand. It's not until he's resurrected that they get it. So in John 2 and 22, the scripture says after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said this and they believed both Jesus and and the truth, what they remember that he said, they remember that he said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you can do it in three days. But by this temple, Jesus meant his body. So when Jesus said, you destroyed this temple and I'll raise it up again, when they first heard that, they were like, ooh, Jesus talking strange again. You know, every now and then he go into strange land and talk, start talking strange. And we just kind of accept he on that little strange thing again, right? They listen to him, they're like, Jesus doing that strange strange thing again. But after he was raised and they was able to look back on what he said, they're like, ooh, he said you destroyed this temple and in three days I'll raise. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about, his, oh, we missed it, man. We, we, you, you look back at something, you ever listen to an old tape or listen to an old sermon and when you heard it the first time, you didn't hear it, but now that you're hearing it again, like, oh, Jesus, there it is. I missed it the first time. Well, now because of his exalted position, they're able to see some things clearly now. That, that's, that's not the only one. Go, go, go. John 13. Go. John 13. John 13 and verse 7. John 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You remember Passover, they washing the disciples' feet. They celebrated Passover. They in the upper room. They washing the disciples' feet. And you know, Peter had a little fit. Didn't want Jesus to wash his feet. And, and Jesus replies in verse 7. Jesus said, I know Peter, you don't want me to wash your feet. He said, you don't understand now why I'm doing it. Someday you will. Yeah. 
I know, I know you don't get it now. You don't get it. You don't understand who I am. You don't even understand the significance of me washing your feet. Because if you understood who I really was, then, then you would be amazed at what I'm doing. But, but you don't get it right now. Someday you're going to get it. You read later on in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, you realize Peter got it. He like, whoo, man, I know who he is now. For my, that's why Peter talks a lot about humility because Peter got it. He understood what Jesus was saying. Flip over one chapter. This is the last one right here. I tell you, John chapter 14 and verse 26. And look at what Jesus says. Verse 25. I'm telling you these things. Everything else, he's telling them about the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the counselor as my representative and by the counselor, I mean the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I myself have told you. Jesus says, it's not until I get to my exalted position that I'll be able to send the Holy Spirit back for him to dwell on the inside of you. Since the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Godhead, he is fully God living on the inside of you, then what the Holy Spirit is going to do, he's going to teach you some things, but he's not just going to teach you some things, he's going to remind you of some things, some other stuff that I told you that you didn't get. He's going to remind you of what I said. He's going to point back to me and point back to my teachings. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to do. So Jesus says, when I go to my exalted position, you're going to get clarity. And it's that clarity that's going to enable you to not just do what I've done, but it's going to enable you to do greater things than what I've done. I know some of y'all can't get excited about that. I lost you. Well, maybe it's not just clarity, but if you understand that because of this exalted position, you're going to get power. Yeah. That's that's the Holy Spirit. You're not you you don't just get clarity. The Holy Spirit also gives you power. Yeah. Acts chapter one verse eight. You shall receive power when after which the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, utmost parts of the earth. But you can't really represent me without the power. What makes the difference in the disciples after Jesus resurrected and the disciples before Jesus resurrected? They got power. After he went up in his exalted position he sent the Holy Spirit back and now they got power on the inside that's why Peter who denied him now can stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach boldly the good news of Jesus Christ because he got power on the inside See, he said from my exalted position I'll be able to empower you in a way that I couldn't empower you while I was present with you and the power on the inside will enable you to do not just what I did but great of things because now all y'all got God living on the inside. You may not get excited about that, but I get excited about God living on the inside of me. That's my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sounds crazy to me, but I thank God. God dwells on the inside of me, and I got power to help me walk right and talk right and live right and act right. It's all because of the power that's on the inside. He said, you're able to do what I've done and then able to do greater things. I, I'm not done, no. He says, he says, you're going to be able to do this because I'm going to be with the Father. And then he says, watch out. You can ask for anything in my name and I'll do it. Wow. So greater is possible for anyone who believes in Jesus. Greater is possible because of his exalted position, but greater is possible as I align with his purpose. Because he, he said, he says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Wait, wait, wait. You can ask anything in my name. Now that part we got. We can use it. But we got we we use it like it's a lucky charm. We say crazy stuff and then we say in Jesus' name. Just just crazy stuff and then we say in Jesus' name. We we use it like it's some some little little, little magic formula or something that that as long as we catch on in Jesus' name, then somehow God just gonna cause it to be. 
So, so we got the concept, but, but, but we miss the essence of it. See, when you mention the name of an individual, you're, you're not only talking about the name, but, but you're also saying, I understand the nature and the power of the individual. So when he says, you say it in my name, he's not just saying, say it in the name of Jesus, but you're saying it, understand the name. You understand what the name stands for. You understand who is in the name. He said, when you say my name, Jesus, God saves. And you understand who I am. You understand that I'm the son of God who came in the flesh. I existed before time. I created everything. And I stepped into time, clothed myself in flesh. And then I laid down my life to it up again. Now, exist at the end of time. You understand that one day every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess that I am Lord, that I'm master, that I'm king, that I'm Satan. You understand that the demons bow down to me. They witness that demon. Say, well, right, Jesus, you coming too early. You messing with us. It's not time yet. Jesus said, when you mention my name, you understand the nature of my name. So he says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now here's what's interesting. He says, I don't do it because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. So we're able to do greater things. It's possible as we align ourselves to the purpose of the Son. Because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Our work don't bring glory to the Father. But the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. So if I align myself with the work of the Son, then I bring glory to the Father. So I got to stop praying crazy prayers because some of my prayers don't align with the purpose of the Son. Because the Son has a purpose for suffering. He did, didn't he? He did. And the Bible talks about to all who live godly will suffer. That's what the Bible talks about. We don't like, we don't like suffering, but that's what the Bible talks about. The, the son lets us know that he got he got purpose. Blessed be you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Both I say, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. But great is your reward in heaven. The, the son, when we align ourselves with his purpose, what's his purpose? He said, My meat is to do my father's will. I, I, I don't need y'all praying. I don't need y'all praying. I, I've already eaten my meat is to do my father's will. All I want to do is please the father. That's why he says in the garden, he says, not my will, but your will be done because my only agenda is the agenda of the father. So that's all I want to do. So anytime I align myself with the work of Jesus, the father gets excited because the father knows he's going to get some glory because the son always points to the father. Check this out. The Holy Spirit points to the son. The son points to the Father. The Holy Spirit working on the inside of me and what he's trying to do is get me to align with the Son because the Son is going to point to the Father. The problem that I have is I don't want to submit to the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of me. But then I want the Son to work on my behalf. I want him to do my stuff instead of me doing his stuff. And then I'm expecting the Father to get some glory from it. He said, oh, it don't work like that. you got to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to put you in alignment with me. And if you get in alignment with me, you can ask whatever you want. And the Father going to grant it. Why? Because the Father knows I'm going to bring him glory. <laughs> Jesus says, Jesus says, you can... You can do greater things because once you align yourself with me, the Father gets excited about what you're doing because he knows you're doing the kind of stuff that I would do. When the last time you prayed like that? Come on, let's just be honest. When you prayed last night, did you pray like that? Did you pray in submission to the Holy Spirit and in alignment with Jesus? <laughs> when, when you, before you went to sleep, because I, I know many of you prayed before you went to sleep. Did you did you pray in submission to the Holy? Did you say, Lord, teach me how to pray? Because I, I don't know how to pray. Sometimes when I pray, I ask a miss, and I don't want to ask a miss because when I ask a miss, I don't get what you want to give me. So I don't want to ask a miss. So teach me how to pray, and, and even when I don't know what to say, teach me to shut up. So the Holy Spirit on the inside of me can speak on my behalf with groanings which cannot be uttered. Did, did you pray in alignment with Jesus? And if not, maybe that's why God didn't answer. Because he didn't say you ask anything according to your will, your agenda, your purpose, your plans, and our answer. He said, no, if you ask anything according to who I am in my name. Because I give glory to the Father. 
he'll do it. Greater things. See, 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 Jesus says you can do greater things when you get an alignment. <laughs> you do want to live out what Jesus says, don't you? We all agree that the front end Jesus said it, so it can't be a lie since it can't be a lie, then I want to line up with it. So, so you do want to line up with what Jesus said. So, so I'm sure all of us want to begin to pray prayers that are in alignment with the name of Jesus and, and the agenda of Jesus because we understand that the work of the Son will always bring glory to the Father. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Maybe that's why sometimes we're doing church work and it don't look like Jesus. Because we were praying, but when we was praying, when nobody submitted to the Holy Spirit, because when nobody submitted to the Holy Spirit, everybody couldn't get in line with Jesus. Because we couldn't get in line with Jesus, the Father just looked at us and was like, hmm. We're like, really? Y'all called the meeting for this? Y'all spent an hour on this? Really? So, let's hold you too long. Finally, finally, he says, he says, yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, now, here's what messed me up, because um, Jesus is talking about anybody doing greater things. Anybody doing greater things because of his exalted position. Anybody doing greater things who's in alignment with his purpose. And, and Jesus says twice, ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. He says it twice. Anytime they repeat, that might mean it's important. He says, ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. Not only does he say, ask me anything twice, but he says, I will do it twice. Which is interesting to me because when you think about Jesus doing greater things, Jesus says, you'll be able to do greater things. Anybody who believes in me will be able to do the things I've done and they'll be able to do greater things. And, and, and then Jesus goes on to talk about, if you ask, I'll do it. If you ask, I'll do it. Now here's what's interesting about it. Jesus says, if you ask, I'll do it. Okay, try it again. Jesus says, if you ask, I'll do it. Jesus says, anybody who believes in me will be able to do the things that I've done, and they'll also be able to do greater things. You can ask anything in my name, and, and because the Father knows that I want to give him glory, then the Father is going to answer, I'll do it. And if you ask anything, Jesus says, I'll do it. Jesus says, I'll do it. But he says, you'll be able to do the things I've done, and you'll be able to do greater things, but Jesus says, I'll do it. Now I know, I know, I know. It messed me up. I kept, I kept coming back to him like Jesus. What you talking about? Why, why do you keep talking like that? Here's, here's what Jesus basically is communicating to us. Jesus says, if you understand what's taking place, if you get the principle, you realize that even though I'm gone, I'm still working. <laughs> all right, all right. When, 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 when Luke writes the, the Gospel of Luke, he says, "Oh Theophilus, I, I want to write to you about the things that Jesus began to do." And then when he writes in the Acts, he says, "Oh Theophilus, in my first book, I talked to you about the things that Jesus began to do." Anytime somebody says "began to do," that means they're not done. <laughs> He began to do it, but you do know that in Acts, he's gone. He's in his exalted position. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, but he said he began to do it. So that means what Jesus began to do, he's not done doing yet. So how Jesus doing what he's doing if he's not present with us to do it? Well, he's in his exalted position, but you do understand that in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says that the spirit who dwells on the inside is not just the Holy Spirit, but he's the spirit of Christ. So Jesus says, here's what's happening. I'm, I'm actually inviting you to join in with me so that I might work in you and through you and with you. So when you do what you do, understand it's not you doing it, but it's me at work in you. Jesus says, you'll be able to do what I've done and greater things because I'm in you now. Now I'm in you. I'm operating in Jesus. You abide in me and I abide in you. You'll bear much for, I'm just trying to take y'all the Bible because some of y'all looking at me like my theology might be off. Jesus said, if you and me and I and you, you'll do much. You'll bear much fruit. Jesus says, I'm at work in you. That's, wait, wait, that's why he says we're the body of Christ. We're trying to grow up into the head who is Jesus the Christ, right? So Jesus says, when you do what you do, understand I'm at work in you, working on your behalf to accomplish my purpose and my agenda so your stuff 
that you do begins to look like me because I'm the one doing it through you. Jesus says you ain't going to do what I've done and do greater things because now it's not just me, but it's me in all y'all. When I was there the first time, it was just one of me, but now I'm in all of y'all, working through all of y'all, using all of y'all for my glory and my purpose and my honor. And if you just surrender, I can do in you stuff that you never imagined before. Okay. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Let me let me bring it home like this. I I I I my mama told me to stop saying I grew up poor. So let me correct that. I grew up close to Paul. Close to Paul. Didn't realize what Paul looked like, Mama said, but it looked like Poe to me. Since I grew up close to Poe, there's a whole lot of stuff I wasn't exposed to until I met my wife. I ain't know nothing about stir fry until I met my wife. I know nothing about that. I, I, I didn't know nothing about little trees. They call it broccoli. Until I met my wife. I had, had that kind of culture. I ate grains. I, I ate cornbread. I knew about collards. I knew about mustards. I knew about turnips. I even knew about kale, but I didn't know nothing about broccoli, cauliflower, stuff like that until I until I met my wife, so she, she's helped to, to kind of bring me along a bit. So, so growing up as a child, all I understood was a good old fashioned regular toothbrush. I just knew a toothbrush, you put toothpaste on it, you put it in your mouth, and then you work it. That's all I knew, that's all I knew. As I've been working with my wife, my wife has been working with me now, she's brought me along a little bit, and uh, the dentist has partnered with her to bring me along a little bit. My wife has exposed me to a thing, a toothbrush, that costs a whole lot of money, called Sonicare. It's, it's not $2.50 like a toothbrush. And, in Walmart, it costs a whole lot of money. It's called the Sonicare toothbrush. And one of the interesting things about the Sonicare tooth, they say it helps to keep your teeth real clean. The Sonicare toothbrush, when I first got it, all I know is about a regular toothbrush, $2.50 toothbrush. You put the toothpaste on it, and you just, you just got to move it. You got to work it. It don't do nothing if you don't do it. So you just got to move it. You got to work it. You got to take it everywhere that you want it to go, because that's all I knew about was $2.50 toothbrush. But now they exposed me to a Sonicare. When I first got exposed to a Sonicare, I put toothpaste on the thing, and Cut the thing on. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do what I normally do. My two dollar fifty cent toothbrush. I'm moving it around, all that kind of stuff, right? Go back to the dentist. I'm thinking, man, I paid all this money for this toothbrush. Surely you're gonna be impressed with my dental hygiene, and you're gonna compliment me on it. Then say, man, what you doing? I said, well, but my wife went out and got me a, you know, a care toothbrush, so I should be a little bit better. He said, no, 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 no. What, what, what are you doing when you brush your teeth with the Sonicare toothbrush? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it in my hand, I put toothpaste on, and then I'm doing like this. I'm doing what, what I know to do with a toothbrush. He said, no, no, no. He said, they made the toothbrush so that once you put the toothpaste on it, the toothbrush will do all the work. All you got to do is put it in your mouth and just sit it up against your teeth. I said, all I got to do is just put it in my mouth, sit it up against my teeth. He said, yeah, you just move it every now and then, and it'll do all the work for y'all. You just got to put it in your mouth, just sit up against your teeth. It'll do all the work for you. I said, okay, man, that's pretty cool. So I went home, I put toothpaste on my little Sonicare toothbrush, put it up against my mouth, and, and that thing really does just do all the work for you. So I'm working, working, working. I'm like, cool, man. I'm moving around, work, 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 move it, work, work, work. I'm like, man, cool. I don't get tired no more. I don't have no problems with my elbow, right? Move around. I'm like, cool, all right. It do all the work for you. I didn't understand that they made it in such a way that I ain't have to do nothing but just put it in the right place. Once I put it in the right place, it was already designed to do what it was supposed to do so that it could produce what it's supposed to do. The problem that many of us have with Christianity is we're trying to do what only Jesus can do. Jesus said, I'll do it. You, you, you're trying to live this life in your own power and in your own strength. Jesus said, you can't live it in your power and your strength. Just let me do it. Let, let me work on you. Let me control your tongue. Let me control your thought. He said, if you just surrender to me, I'll do it. I'll, I'll move around in your mind and get your thoughts right. Let me do it. I'll fix your attitude. Let me do it. I'll work on your heart and soften your heart all the time. Jesus said, just let me do it. And if you let me do it, you'll be able to do what I've done and greater works. And that's all I came to tell somebody that they just let Jesus do it. Decide that you know what, you can't do what Jesus can do, so you're going to let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. And you just going to surrender and allow Jesus to work miracles in your life. And if you let Jesus do it, it's true for pastor and it's true for people. 
We will not only be able to do what he's done, but we'll be able to do greater works. Now here's what I want to ask you. Moment in time. As you hear the message, if God is speaking to you, I just want to ask you to bow every head bow. Maybe in your journey, you've been struggling. Maybe you're like me. Sometimes I, I try to take over from Jesus. I try to do what only he could do. I knew I couldn't do it before I trusted him. I sure enough can't do it now. But I tried. And maybe like me, today you had to be reminded to let Jesus do it. To surrender to him. Allow him to be who he is. He's the only one that has the power and the authority. He was the only one who could save you. He's the only one who can sanctify you. And he'll be the only one who can glorify you. But you gotta let him do it. This morning, I mean this afternoon with every head bowed, eye closed, I want to encourage you to just talk to the Father. If you know you haven't been doing the works of Jesus, because Jesus cannot lie, Jesus says anybody who believes can do what I've done. So if you haven't done it, Jesus is not the problem. So maybe it's a good time just to confess and acknowledge I haven't, I haven't looked like Jesus. I haven't been doing the kind of stuff that Jesus did. When I go around outsiders and sinners, they don't greet me like they greeted Jesus. They run. I don't show compassion like Jesus did. I'm not able to touch people in such a way that their lives are forever changed like Jesus did. So if your life doesn't look like that, Jesus is not the problem. Jesus said, let me do it. And you can do what I've done. And maybe you are there where you're letting him do it and you're able to do the kind of stuff that he's been doing. Jesus says, if so, greater. Greater. He says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let me do it. Don't become content and complacent because you've been doing it and other people are impressed. Don't become complacent because as other people look at where you are, they celebrate you. You've heard the truth. Jesus says, you can do greater than what I've done. You don't need a title for it. You don't need a pulpit. He said, anybody who believes in me can do greater if you let me do it. So maybe somebody today, you need to trust him for greater. So Father, as we bow before you, some of us need to trust you to do what you did. But there are some of us who need to trust you for greater. All of us want to get to greater. Because you said it can happen. So help us in this moment in time to not be content with complacent, casual Christianity. Because you said we can do what you've done and we can do greater. We just got to let you do it. So you now, I pray, is that Pastor Paula would let you do it. My prayer is that Sister Paula would let you do it. My prayer is that the ministers of this church would let you do it. My prayer is that the leaders and the members of this church would let you do it. My prayer, God, is that the members and leaders of St. Paul would let you do it. That 
if we would all just surrender to let you do it. So that the Father might get glory out of our lives. Do it, Jesus, is our prayer. Let's say together, amen. Amen. Thank and praise God for Pastor Hubbard and a very powerful word.